In the late 80s, San Francisco was victim to several earthquakes, the first of which occurred in June of 1988 and was a 5.3 magnitude earthquake, then another in August of 1989 which was a 5.4 magnitude quake. But the focus of this entry doesn't occur until October 17th of 1989. That day, Game 3 of the World Series featuring the Oakland Athletics and the San Francisco Giants was scheduled to take place. Viewers of the game back home were having a great time when all of a sudden, the signal for the broadcast became choppy and you could hear one of the commentators, Al Michaels, say, I'll tell you what, we're having an earth before cutting off. This occurred at about 5pm. After resting on an ABC World Series, screen for about 15 seconds, the audio came back and you can hear the roars and screams from the crowd at the game. Then not long after the audio comes back, you can also hear Al Michael say, well, I don't know if we're on the air, we are in commercial I guess. Other commentators would reply to Al acknowledging that they can indeed hear him. Luckily for these commentators, the facility they were in withstood the quake. However, others were not so fortunate. What had just occurred was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake which caused catastrophic damage to the city. 63 deaths occurred with over 3.7 thousand injuries. As far as damages go, they totaled to about $6 billion. Over a mile of the top deck of the Cypress Viaduct had crumbled, crushing people and vehicles underneath it. Elsewhere, buildings up to 5 stories tall collapsed and fires broke out as a result of the damaged gas pipelines. Additionally, there was significant damage to the water mains which made fighting those fires incredibly difficult. Some of them even burned for several days. The entire time this was unfolding, news outlets and other entities were recording the destruction live. This case takes us back to 2015, specifically August 26th in Roanoke, Virginia. Two people named Allison Parker and Adam Ward tragically lost their lives in an act of violence. Allison was a news reporter while Adam Ward was a photojournalist. The two worked as a team at WDBJ7 and over time they became great friends. So very early in the morning of the 26th, both Allison and Adam got up to prepare for their day's work. The two were tasked with carrying out an interview with a woman named Vicki Gardner at Manetta's Bridgewater Plaza about the 50th anniversary event for Smith Mountain Lake. The segment, which was part of a standard morning news program, began airing live at about 6.40 a.m. And shortly after it began, a man crept towards the group of Allison, Adam, and Vicky who were standing at the upper level of the building. Obviously, the group just thought that the guy was some random person going about his own business. But the situation gradually got more uncomfortable when it became clear that the man was headed straight towards the trio. Then as he came face to face, the man reached for a gun and opened fire. It was reported that at least 8 gunshots were fired. Viewers of the channel watched in shock and confusion as Adam's camera dropped to the ground. Then they saw a man come into frame of the fallen camera pointing a gun. The station rushed to switch feeds and we can see the baffled face of the anchor, Kimberly McBroom. Kimberly attempted to make sense of the situation, stating that the bangs sounded like gunshots or a car backfiring. After a brief moment, once the gravity of the situation settled, police and medical officials were called to the scene. But unfortunately, it was much too late for Allison and Adam. Both Allison and Adam had received several gunshots to their head and torso. As for Vicky, she was shot in her back where she fell to the ground and played dead. Authorities later reported that it wasn't 8 gunshots that went off, but 15 instead. Luckily, investigators were able to find the identity of the gunman rather fast. It was a man named Vester Lee Flanagan II. Vester had a career in journalism, but later lost his job in March of 2000. Vester was a general assignment news reporter at WTOC-TV in Savannah, Georgia until 1999, when he became a reporter for WTWC-TV in Tallahassee, Florida. According to Vester, the work environment in this new location was far from ideal, as he was frequently berated by his co-workers about his sex. 
orientation. However, after further investigation, it seemed that Vester himself was not exactly a nice person either. Several of his female co-workers reported that Vester frequently verbally abused him. This was often on the tail end of receiving constructive criticism regarding his reporting. Even if Vester got a certain detail wrong about a certain topic, he would lash out if you mentioned it. As a result, nobody really wanted to work with Vester and called his behavior diva-like. Ultimately, he lost his job in 2000. Vester believed that his firing was racially motivated, so he decided to file a lawsuit against WTWC. This lawsuit was later settled in January of 2001. Vester went on to hop around various reporting gigs until 2013, where he was yet again said to be rather volatile and fired from his last position. This time, Vester actually had to be escorted out of the facility by police. At about 11am on the day Vester committed the shooting, he took to Twitter and Facebook where he uploaded a first person video that ran for about one minute. In it, Vester was walking towards Allison, Adam, and Vicky while showing his firearm to the camera. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the group did not notice the gun when Vester was making his way towards them. In the video, he also berated the trio and called them names such as A note written by Vester was also found. In the note, Vester spoke about what he felt was unfair racially motivated treatment in his past workplaces, explicitly saying that he was being targeted for being a homosexual black man. Furthermore, Vester stated that what set him off to commit this act of violence was the Charleston church shooting, which occurred two months earlier. One line in the note said, I felt like a human powder keg, just waiting to go boom. He went on to voice his admiration towards other notorious gunmen, including Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold as well as Sung Hoi Cho. Back to the actual shooting. Again, Allison and Adam both died at the scene while Vicky survived after being transported to a hospital where she had to undergo surgery. The Franklin County Sheriff was notified by the WDBJ general manager that the man shown in the footage was Vester Flanagan. Vester had jumped into his Ford Mustang and took off from the site of the crime. He then called ABC News around 10 a.m. confessing to the shooting. Police were able to track Vester's phone and locate him. It was determined that he ditched his vehicle at the Roanoke Blacksburg Regional Airport before renting a Chevrolet Sonic, which he took onto I-81 headed north. Authorities were updated about the vehicle change and a state trooper identified the Sonic at 11.20 a.m. The trooper called for backup and pulled Vester over. But once Vester realized that the trooper knew exactly who he was, Vester sped off. During the chase, which was less than two miles, Vester's vehicle strayed off the road where it was later immobilized. As authorities inched their way closer, they realized that Vester had died. He had taken his own life with the same firearm he had used earlier. This entry refers to a man named Daniel Victor Jones. Daniel was born on April 15, 1958 in Long Beach, California. He worked as a maintenance worker for the Renaissance Hotel, also located in Long Beach. Around the age of 40, Daniel was diagnosed with HIV, and not long after, he noticed this sort of mass growing on the back of his neck. At first, when it was still small, Daniel thought it was some sort of ingrown hair or something. But after getting it checked out, Daniel was told that he had cancer. So by April of 1998, Daniel was living with not only HIV, but cancer as well. This led to a heated disagreement with his health insurer, sending Daniel into a deep pit of despair. He really believed that he was going to die soon. As a sort of last hurrah, Daniel wanted to do something that would get the attention of the masses before he died. It didn't take long for him to come up with an idea. So on April 30th, 1998, at about 3 p.m., Daniel drove his gray Toyota pickup truck to the transition loop of a highway in Los Angeles and stopped his vehicle. He then got out with his dog and they both plopped down in front of the truck. In Daniel's hands was a shotgun. 
As traffic zoomed by, Daniel pointed the gun at the drivers. Obviously, this concerned a lot of people, so those that saw Daniel called the police and reported him. Not long after, calls about Daniel started coming in. Then Daniel himself called the police. He started venting, saying that he was all messed up in his head and was pissed off about the situation regarding his health and his health insurer. For example, he told the dispatcher that he would have to wait a month to schedule an appointment and then another one to two months afterwards to receive the results of a test. Daniel called this mistreatment. At one point during the phone call, Daniel fired his shotgun two times, which led to authorities rushing to shut down the two freeways that led to Daniel. Daniel went back inside of his truck when police began to arrive at the scene. He fumbled around in his truck, tossing out clothing and a videotape, before exiting the vehicle and undoing a large banner. Across it read, HMOs are in it for the money. Live free, love safe, or die. Due to the wind, Daniel had to use a weighted object to keep the banner from flying away. From time to time, Daniel would face the helicopter circling him and display obscene gestures. Just as authorities were preparing to start negotiating with Daniel, he lit a Molotov cocktail inside of his truck which set the vehicle on fire. Daniel's clothing also caught fire, so he got out of his truck and started running around the freeway in an attempt to extinguish the flames. Eventually, the flames would disappear when Daniel took his pants off. Daniel was clearly distraught and unstable. He walked to the edge of the freeway bridge as if he was going to jump off. However, he would just move away from the edge. Around 3.50pm, Daniel made his way back to the truck, which was still burning at this point, pulled out his shotgun, and took his own life. This entire event was broadcasted live and many children were able to view it which led to criticism later on. In total, the standoff between Daniel and the police lasted just under an hour. Some people questioned authorities as to why didn't they just go in sooner, but this was in fear that Daniel had some sort of bomb or other dangerous devices inside the vehicle. And yes, in case you're wondering, the whole time the truck was on fire, Daniel's dog was still inside. When police finally moved in, they found additional Molotov cocktails, shotgun shells, and the charred remains of Daniel's dog. If you recall, I mentioned that Daniel threw out a videotape from his truck. Turned out that this tape was a video side note which was recorded the day before the incident. In the video, Daniel said, I'm not going to fight the disease. It has affected my neurological system. I'm not going to end up crazy. I'm not happy with what's happening to my situation, and I'm going to draw attention to it whichever way I can. Daniel ended the video with, I'm a dead man. See ya. Donald Herbert was the name of a firefighter from Buffalo, New York. On December 29, 1995, just days after Christmas, Daniel and his fellow firefighters were tasked with putting out a fire at a home. At one point, Donald found himself on the roof of the home when it suddenly collapsed. This pinned Donald into the attic of the home of a fire that was still raging. It took about 5-6 to six minutes before Donald was able to be saved, and during that whole time, Donald's brain was not receiving any oxygen at all. Shortly after being rescued, Donald had a cardiac arrest and was transported to a hospital. And it was at the hospital where Donald slipped into what was described as a minimally conscious state. Donald couldn't do anything and medical professionals had to feed him through a tube to keep him alive. But on April 30th, 2005, Donald suddenly woke up. His very first words were asking where his wife was. The nurse assigned to Donald at the time rushed to contact his family and inform them of the good news. But Donald was more or less blind, so he couldn't see the faces of his friends and family. Nevertheless, he was able to tell whose voice was whose when everyone arrived. Along with being blind, Donald was bound to his wheelchair as a result of muscular atrophy. Donald was able to speak with his four children once more who were 14, 13, 11, and 3 years old when the accident occurred. Donald and his loved ones spoke with each other for over 14 hours that first day back with each other. While this was an amazing development, the path back to normality was a tough one. Nurses reported that Donald frequently twisted and turned and cried out in his sleep. 
likely believing that he was still trapped in the attic back on the day of that fire. Donald's movements while asleep grew more and more violent, to the point where people worried that he might flail himself off of his bed. Because of this, one of Donald's family members was always by his side while he slept. But one night, the family member assigned to watch over Donald was much too tired and decided to leave. Just so happens that night, Daniel had another violent outburst and threw himself off of his bed where his head collided with the floor. Donald didn't die from this injury, but he was no longer lucid because of it. Then on February 21st, 2006, Donald died as a result of pneumonia. Rodney Alcala is the name of a serial killer who was sentenced to death for committing five murders in the late 70s. Rodney went on to confess to another two murders and is believed to be tied to at least eight other homicide cases. However, many investigators are of the opinion that Rodney's victims surpass well over 100. Over his years of killing and Rodney amassed a collection of over 1,000 photographs of women, teenagers, and little boys. Some of the people in these photos actually turned out to be victims of Rodney's. He was born on August 23, 1943 in San Antonio, Texas and died of natural causes in July of 2021. One of the earliest signs of things to come occurred in 1961, when Rodney was 17 and serving in the U.S. Army as a paratrooper. Rodney's commanding officer reported that Rodney had manipulative tendencies and was rather disobedient. Furthermore, he was found assaulting several young women during this time. Then in 1964, Rodney had what seemed to be a mental breakdown where he went AWOL and hitchhiked his way back to his mother's home. He was ultimately discharged. Rodney was diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder and malignant narcissism with psychopathy. But for this entry, we'll be looking at the time when Rodney popped up on a show called The Dating Game. This show earned him the name The Dating Game Killer. Rodney appeared on the show in 1978 and by this time he had already assaulted and murdered a number of different people. He was even on the 10 most wanted fugitives list in 1971. In 1968, he and beat an 8-year-old after luring her into his Hollywood apartment. Then in 1971, Rodney raped and murdered a 23-year-old named Cornelia Crilly. However, it should be mentioned that the murder of Cornelia remained unsolved for decades. That same year, Rodney was arrested and sentenced to three years in prison for child molestation. In 1974, Rodney was paroled and then rearrested for a 13-year-old. Then Rodney was paroled yet again in 1976 after serving an additional two years. Fast forward to 1977, Rodney flew to Manhattan where he killed 23-year-old Ellen Jane Hover. At the time, Ellen had only been reported missing. Police did question Rodney, believing he was responsible for her disappearance, but he only said that he knew of Ellen, nothing more. Investigators didn't find Ellen's body yet, so they couldn't say for sure that Rodney had actually murdered her. Eventually, Ellen's remains would be found under large rocks on a hill near the Hudson River. So with all of this information in mind, it's definitely eerie to see Rodney on a dating show where the winner gets to go on a date with someone. The show's host, Jim Lange, described Rodney as a very strange person but was a successful photographer. Rodney went on to win the show and got a date with The Bachelorette, Cheryl Bradshaw. But funny enough, Cheryl refused to actually follow through with the date after having a conversation with Rodney, saying that she was just way too creeped out by him. This was a decision that may very well have saved her life, as Rodney went on to kill and more people in the following years. 